Humbly exalting you, I come before your throne. Rejoicing in your presence, I worship you alone. Great King eternal, ancient of days, I know you worthy of my praise. I will glorify, glorify, glorify your name in all I do. All my praise I bring as an offering. I will glorify your name. My tongue will never cease to praise your holy name. While things of earth will perish, you remain the same. From the depths below to the heights above, nothing can separate me from your love. I will glorify, glorify, glorify your name in all I do. All my praise to bring an offering. <coughs> All my praise. I bring as an offering, I will glorify your name. Okay, we're going to sing that maybe next time. And thank you very much. Splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny was the lonely hill of Golgotha, there to lay down his life for me. Oh, 
that isn't love, then heaven's a me. heaven not a myth, God's love is not a myth. God's love is real and evident with us here this morning. I'm going to give you a little task to do, and I would like for you to have a conversation with the person closest to you as to what you think the answer might be. And the only wrong answer would be something outside of the pages from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, just, just to make sure that you know that. If you had to say what is the most significant passage of Scripture, and it could be for you, what is the most significant passage of Scripture for you, or what do you think is the most significant passage of Scripture in the Bible, what answer would you have? All right, have a chat with the person next to you just quickly while I get myself wired up. someone just to moderate the sound back there for me to make sure it's exactly the way it needs to be so that I'm not blasting everybody out or, or so that somebody can hear me. If somebody could do that for me. BJ's back there. Thank you, sir. Sir William. Excellent job. All right. Who wants to share the most significant passage of Scripture in the Bible? Did you have a hard time with that? Because all of the Bible is significant, right? How many of you came up with John 3.16? Just curious. Golden text of the scripture. Excellent. Where would we be without it? Anyone else want to share? You have another passage of scripture, Lynette. It's back at the back. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. That's a good one. That's where it all begins, doesn't it? Right? Yes. Thanks, Jackie.
Seek the Lord while he may be found, Jackie. Thanks, John. I love having people in church who know the word. Amen. John 1, 1 and 2, I think. Anyone else want to share? Most significant passage. Yes, Lord. Church, you ought to just say amen right there, right? I am crucified with Christ. So we have the truths of God's word, and then we have the application, what they mean to us. And there are truths in every line of scripture. And I believe that every line of scripture is significant. But there are times in our lives when there are certain passages of scripture that are significant for us. And as we've been studying through John 17, I have felt the, the, the weight, can I use that word? Not the burden, but I've felt the gravity and the weight of this passage of scripture to the point where I, I'd be willing to suggest to you that John chapter 17 is one of those most significant passages of scripture. I would also include uh, the book of Romans, the first eight or nine chapters, but I would, I would certainly also include um, as, a, as a chapter to go to Romans chapter eight. I love that passage of scripture so much, but we are going to work our way back into John chapter 17 this morning. And there, there should be several passages on the scripture on the screen for you to look at this morning as we work through that. But because I believe that John 17 is significant, and one of the reasons that I'm saying that to you, as has been read this morning from Hebrews chapter 4, is that the Lord Jesus is our high priest. And when we're thinking about the high priestly prayers of Jesus and the high priestly work of Jesus for us today, then we have the foundation for that in John chapter 17. And it gives us a clear insight into the God of the universe, the Lord of creation, Genesis 1, 1 that it was read, and the Savior for each and every believer. Now listen to this. For each and every believer, I believe it has the power to transform our walk with the Lord and give our journey of faith purpose, direction, comfort, and encouragement. It can be like our daily intake of spiritual nutrients. Ian Griffith Thomas says that in this chapter, the disciples obtain a fuller revelation of their master than they had ever known before. They had walked with him, they had ministered with him for three and a half years. And in this moment, as they have left the upper room and are headed toward the Mount of Olives, toward Gethsemane, toward his betrayal, toward that prayer of agony, Jesus reveals more about himself to his disciples, to his followers than he ever has before. It is as if we are like, when we read John chapter 17, it is like we are having that holy hush, like the priest of the Old Testament walking into the Holy of Holies, into the tabernacle. It is a blessed and vital insight into the very heart and mind of God himself where we are allowed to see his glory and his nature, his plan and his purpose and activity for each one who follows him. Can we bow our heads in prayer this morning as we look into the scripture specifically? Lord Jesus, I pray that you would open hearts and minds. I pray that you would give me clarity of thought Help me to be able to, to deliver the word that you've given me this week from John chapter 17, Father God. I pray that it would be a blessing to each and every heart in some way. And draw us closer to yourself. Give us what we need, the tools that we need, the equipment. As you say in your word, you equip us for every good work. Equip us, dear Lord, this morning for the work that you've called us to do. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This high priestly prayer of Jesus, which I'll read with you in just a minute. Uh, I'm going to give you just a, a few things about this prayer. It is a prayer of praise to the glory of God. We talked about the glorious nature of God last week. It is a prayer of intercession for the followers of Christ. Both his disciples who were on hand, but the last part of the chapter certainly includes everyone who follows him later. It is a prayer of the foundations of the, of the past and future prophecy. So we have two important things that Jesus is doing here in this prayer. He is reminding us of the foundations before the world began. Of who he is with God himself. And he reminds us of future prophecy that he is coming again. It is a prayer of mission. The Lord's simple plan for us in a world does, that does not know him is to live for him so that we can be that, that testimony, that complete witness for God as we live in this world. It is a prayer of unity for everyone who claims the name of Christ. As I said before, as we looked at John chapter 17 specifically, we looked at the glorious nature of God. The highest goal of Jesus was to glorify God. And Jesus also asked the Father to glorify Him in two different ways, both in authority and in presence. Because those are the two elements of glorification. The authority that He gave Jesus, the Lord of the universe, the Lord of creation, and Redeemer of His people. And He also gives us His presence, just as we've seen in the Shekinah glory in the tabernacle, so we see the glorious presence of God in our hearts today, in the Word of God, with the Spirit in our hearts. We also see that Jesus says that He is glorified in those who are given to Him, that His followers bring glory to Him, and are also glorified in Himself. So if you missed last Sunday's message, that was it in a nutshell. A very concise nutshell, I must admit. But it is last Sunday's message, very quickly summarized for us. But as I read through this part of the passage this morning, I want you to also look at the generous giving nature of God. And that is our main theme this morning, is to look at this generous nature, generous giving nature of who God is. Because as Jesus prays, and this should be a lesson to us as we pray, that we are praying in the very nature of God. That we not remind God of who He is, but remind us of who God is as we pray, because that brings glory to God. So I'm reading from John chapter 17. I'm not going to start in verse 1, but I'm looking at verse 6 and following, 6 to 19. And I want you to look with me for the ways in which God is, gener is a generous and giving God. And we'll focus on that for a little bit this morning, God willing. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. 
As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also might be sanctified in truth. Now if you've read that with me through this morning, or listened to the reading of the Word of God, you would understand that there is so much in this passage of Scripture that we could take verse by verse or theme by theme. There are many themes that are present in John chapter 17. And there's a lot of different directions that we can go. But I really was compelled this week to bring you this message on the generous giving nature of God as we see in this passage of Scripture. As Jesus is praying this prayer to the Father, and in this particular instance, He is praying specifically for His disciples, it is full of what God is, has already given Him and given His disciples. And that's significant for me, and it's something that I think we not only need to know about, but it is something that we need to cherish. And so I'm going to look specifically at the generous nature of God this morning. In, John, in James chapter 1 and verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Every good gift comes from God. We know that. John, Luke chapter 6 and verse 37 and 38. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemned, condemn not. Sorry. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For, look at that last part of verse 38. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. God is an abundant giving God. There are two verses from Ephesians that I want to read to you this morning. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with what? With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 7 to 8. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, and listen to this, according to the riches of His grace, which He, what? Lavished upon us. Oh, that, that deserves just to step back and think about the fact that the riches of His grace are lavished upon us. It reminds us of the of the woman bringing the alabaster ointment and pouring out a year's worth of salary on the Lord's feet and wiping His feet with her hair because of that, just to honor and glorify Him. That lavish praise. But how much more has Jesus, the Lord Jesus, done for us? He has lavished us with His grace. He's not stingy. With His grace, He has lavished it upon us. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. Instruct those who are rich in this present age, in the present age, not to be conceited and not to put their hope in the uncertainty of wealth, but in God who richly provides all things for us to enjoy. I was reading a quote from C.S. Lewis this morning. In one of his books, he talks about the fact that if we love something that, that is not going to be with us forever, it is wasted love. That's interesting, isn't it? If we love something that is not going to be with us forever, I know you can take this for what it's worth. I know there's a lot of fur brows this morning. I love my house. I love living in my house. I love my wife's new kitchen. I still haven't found everything yet, but I, I actually love going home and being home. That's who I am. But my house is not gonna be there forever. I thank God for a roof over my head and full walls around me and, and drafty windows. I thank God for that. But that house is not going to be there forever. That's not where my... It's, it's a creature comfort that I love, but it's not something that I put my hope in, right? It's not something that all of my treasures are there in my house. 
and God willing, my treasures are laid up in heaven. Some of my treasures are in my sock drawer because I love socks, don't I? I'm just joking. Stay with me. Right? Don't love. Don't put all of your love in something that is not going to be here forever, but love those things for that are eternal because in heaven, that is where we are going to spend the rest of eternity. I don't even know if that's a, the right thing to say because what is the rest of eternity? We will be in heaven for eternity. That's more correct, isn't it? Right? We're not spending anything. We're just present with the Lord. And that's what we should focus our love on. And that's what the Lord Jesus has focused His own love on, on us because we are going to be with Him forever. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah? So He is focusing His love and attention not on the material things of this earth, but on the things that are going to be with Him forever. Take a moment to reflect on the goodness of God's grace to you. <coughs> Take a moment to reflect on all that God has given you. It's too hard to do in a split second, isn't it? Because you start thinking, oh, God's given me this, God's given me this, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And yeah, of course you think about the things that you've lost. Because life's experience is full of losses as well. But my mother always told me, and my father, God always gives a better thing than that he takes away. Exceeding joy tomorrow for the tears we shed. God gives us great things. There is too much for us to think about in a split second of all that God has given us. But we will focus on God and His giving nature this morning. Now the next two points, I know you're going to think they're original. They're not. They're straight from the ESV study Bible and forgive me, but I couldn't come up with anything better than that. In this passage of scripture, we see the Father gave gifts to Jesus. Let's notice those things and it's going to be a little bit of a laundry list, but, but stay with me. And I think it will be important for you to, t to take some time and look at these individually throughout the week or the days ahead. This is what the Father gave to Jesus according to John chapter 17, verses 6 to 19. Authority to give eternal life. That's what the Father gave to the Lord Jesus. He gave Him people out of the world. Have you ever thought about the fact that you're a gift from God to the Lord Jesus? A work to accomplish, that's what he gave to the Lord Jesus. His words, his name, his glory. That's what John 17 teaches us, that the Father gave gifts to Jesus. In comparison, see what the Son gives to believers, to his disciples. In chapter 17, verse 2, we see that he gave to his disciples and his followers eternal life. Verse 2 says, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. There's that double gift of giving or three times in the uh, authority over all flesh, eternal life and all whom you have given him. Chapter 17, verses 8, to 4, 8 and 14. He has given us the words of life, or have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. That is amazing that God would love us so much that he would bestow this gift not only of eternal life, but He would give us the very words that we need for daily living, for belief in our hearts that we know that He is real and that we know the Word is real, that it is true, and that we have a home in heaven one day. And they have received them and come to know in truth that I came from you. Verse 14, just down a little bit. I have given them your word. The world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
We're focusing on that fact that I have given them your word. Have you ever thought about what it would be like if we knew about Jesus, but we didn't have the Bible? <laughs> you look in that same way, I would think. What? That doesn't mean it sound plausible or feasible or possible that we could know about Jesus without knowing the Bible, right? God has given us both the Lord Jesus' his life as well as the very words that he spoke and the inspired word of God so that we would know him more fully. And just as I said earlier, as the disciples were with him for those three and a half years of ministry and Jesus taught in parables and they stood back and said, what is he saying now? And then Jesus starts speaking clearly and they go, oh, you're not speaking in figurative language anymore. Now we understand what you're saying. But Jesus is praying so clearly here. He is praying to the Father, but his words are instructional both to his disciples and to us to reveal the very nature of God. In comparison, we see what the Father has given eternal life, the Father's words, and the Father's name. John chapter 17, verses 6 and 26. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Verse 26, down at the bottom of that chapter. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love which, with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. There is our love theme this morning. As we think about the songs that we have sung, we have the Father's name. We also have the Father's glory, chapter 17 and verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. There is almost always, unfortunately, in every church that I've been in, an element of disunity. It's a sad dare I say condemning, I use that word lightly, not heavily, but a sad fact about Christians is that there is disunity because we lose sight of the most important things. I might come back to that in just a minute. So we don't just have life, but we have eternal life. And the life that we have on earth, John chapter 10 and verse 10 says we can have it abundantly. Verse 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays, his down, lays down his life for the sheep. Can you take a minute and do a little bit of discerning test in your own brain this morning? Everybody needs to do this day by day. What in your life is life-giving and God-honoring and will take your mind toward eternity? And what in your life is killing and destroying you and sapping your spiritual energy and is going to make you feel like a walking dead person as a Christian? I can't answer that for each and every one of you. Only you can. But I guarantee you, for everyone here this morning, everyone who's breathing air and, and in flesh and blood this morning, there's bits and pieces of your life, whether it's intentional or unintentional, that would try to drain you and kill you and destroy your spiritual life today if you were to give it any kind of ground at all. God says he's given it to us abundantly. There's that generous nature of God. I came that they may have life and that they have it abundantly. We don't just have the Father's words, but we have all of the words which the Spirit reminds us of his words. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given by. 
inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished or equipped unto every good work. I'm assuming you know the Word of God. Most of you do. You're just a little bit shy and backward. And, you know. God has given us all that we need for life and Godliness. If you don't have this marked in your scripture or some way highlighted or written down, I want you to do it because it is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. You've heard those superlatives before, but here it is again. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. He, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He has granted to us only just a little bit. No. Only what you need for Sunday morning. No. Only what you need in the middle of the night when the baby's crying. No. Only what you need when somebody's a little bit gossipy in your ear. The scripture says his divine power has granted us, here's the generous nature of God, granted to us all things. What does all mean? All. Huh. It means everything. Don't doubt God's word. Don't downplay. Don't discount. Say, well, God gives me everything I need but. You know, he doesn't understand what it's like for me to go to work in the morning in the city and be on that train with those people. And all the things that they are talking about and doing. And I have to rub shoulders with them day, but God doesn't, God knows all about it. And God, in his wisdom and grace and his generosity, has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Look at the rest. Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory. <laughs> How about that? Well, we could camp there for a little bit. Set up a tent. Build a fire. Have some hot dogs. Sausages. Snacks. Whatever you want. Wouldn't that be good? Through the knowledge of Him who has called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Do you see why I think that's important for us to know? Because God has granted to us all things that we need for life and God. We don't just have a new name written down in glory, by the way. He's given us life and godliness, but we have the Father's name. We have that name that is above all names on the adoption papers. Our sins and our debts have been taken from us and nailed to the tree, Colossians says. And they're never to be remembered against us anymore. And he has replaced the sin debt and that reputation of our sinfulness. And he has said, no, I will now bestow on you my name. And it's so much more than we can ever imagine. His name that is above all names. Whereas once we the children of wrath and the children of the evil one, now we are the children of the heavenly king, Lord of lords. And there is one, no one, who can take that from. When I was growing up, we used to sing a song, I'm a child of the king. Did you guys do that? Joel and Dolly? I imagine you did. Lena, did you? Did you? My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. I'm a child of the king. We don't have just the glory of being adopted into the family of God. But we share in the very inheritance that God has given us in Jesus. We are joint heirs with Him. The scripture is full of the generosity of God. However, there is one passage that comes back to mind frequently. And it is this from Romans chapter 5. 
Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But the free gift is not like the trespass, speaking about the sin of Adam that was brought upon all mankind. That's the reference there. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. I'm skipping down to verse 18 in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, church, oh, but where sin increased, grace. grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I remember as a little kid going to camp meeting, we were talking about that the other day, going to camp meeting once a year, and I'm sad that you live in a generation where camp meeting is not a thing. Sort of, I'm sort of sad about that. It's good and bad. But I remember being in Camp Eaton and listening to a preacher. And he was really getting wound up about this grace abounding more. He said, if your sin is this high, and then he jumped as high as he could, grace is this high. And then if your sin is this high, and then he jumped again even higher. I don't know how he was doing it. He jumped as high as he could. And grace is this high. And if your sin is this high, then grace is even higher than that. And if your sin goes all the way to the ceiling, then God's on top of the ceiling with his grace because you cannot out -sin God's grace. And I will never forget that as long as I live. And therefore the sin, the burden of your life, the sin of your sinful nature, and when you give in to those temptations like we talked about this morning already, when you give in to those temp temptations and you think, oh God, you can't love me, I'm not worthy anymore, uh, I can't even be a good Christian, don't you ever say that to yourself because God's grace abounds more and more than your sin. God's grace is greater than your sin. Grace, grace, God's grace. We're talking about the generous nature of God. That word grace comes from the word charis, the unmerited favor of God to man. God is not surprised by your sin. He is not shocked by your sin. He is not stumped by your sin because grace is covered it all. We, City's Word Studies from the New Testament, defines this specifically New Testament use of the word grace or charis as the spontaneous act of God that came from His infinite love in His heart in which He stepped down from His judgment throne to make take upon Himself the guilt and penalty of human sin, thus satisfying His justice, maintaining His government, and making possible the bestowal of salvation upon the sinner who receives it by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who became a sin offering for him on the cross. Thank you, Lord God, for your grace. We can see that God is a giving God. We can see that God's 
giving is generous. And we can also see that not only is his, that is his nature, but that his generous giving comes from a heart of love for you and for me and for the world. So what is the application to all of this this morning? I hope that you've come away this morning already with a, 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 a con conviction in your heart that God is generous in His giving and it is abundant in everything that He does and there is nothing that you can do to keep God's love and grace from affecting being perfectly applied in your life. But the fact of the matter is, church, is that sometimes we live and sometimes we act and sometimes we even believe as if God's grace and His generosity is not enough. Sometimes our view of God is so restricted by our teaching or our limitations within ourselves that we think that God cannot. But I stand before you here this morning based on the word of God that God can always generously give you all things that you need for life and living. Not knowing the heart of God or thinking that you know the heart of God based on what you've been taught without ever thinking or perceiving what you think about, the, about who God is rather than what the Bible actually teaches about the generous giving nature of God will stifle and suffocate your understanding of the generosity of God in you. A warped view of God will affect how you live and how you treat your family and how you treat others around you. If I were to think about people, and if I were to think about the difference between people and people who are generous and people who are not generous, do you know people who are generous? Don't ask them. I don't know whether you're generous or not. I really don't. Most, some of you are, I believe. But do you know people who are generous? How many of you have ever received an, an amazingly generous gift? And you say, oh man, that's just, I was so generous of that person to give me that. What stifles, what's the opposite of generosity? Selfishness, greed. God is not a greedy God. He has everything. How could He be greedy? God is a generous God. Restricted, a restricted view of God of what God can do to supply your needs might be hindering your view of the generosity of God. But based on John chapter 17 and other passages of Scripture this morning, I hope that you can see that God is a generous God. Then you might be asking, why don't I have a Mercedes? Why don't, why don't I have a new kitchen? Why don't I have... Listen carefully. This is going to help you. When God allows you to go without on this earth, it is because of His generous nature to prepare you for a life that is far greater than our temporal life on this earth. Do you hear me? And hear me well. When God causes you or allows you to go through grief and heartache and disappointment and discouragement, it is to allow you to put your faith in the God who never ever fails. It is to prepare your heart and mind, because if it were not, if God gave us everything materially that we need on this earth, we would be completely...
completely happy with that and we would never want to be in heaven. We would just want to live forever on this earth. But God has riches stored up for us that are far greater than anything, anything this world can ever give us and provide for us. Do you understand that? Don't be discontented. Don't be disheartened. Don't be discouraged. Our God knows everything that He's given us. What we need for this life and the next. Lord Jesus, may one word, two words, based on the Spirit of God's work from the Word of God, Find lodging in hearts this morning that we might be the people that you have called us to be. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for your generous nature to us, God. Thank you that you've called us here together in this place. And Lord, I pray that you would bless our final few moments together this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Joy, would you like to come, please? We thank God for that. Wow. I don't know about you, but I, I thank God for that message, Pastor. Thank you very much. Now, I don't know. I was contemplating, like, uh, you know, uh, going back with those years, days, weeks, you know, in my life. We have only the memories and experiences before us we i don't know how long will the lord allow us to you know be here in, in, in on earth but i think i i know while sitting there i would say within me i have everything because we have i have the lord jesus christ so this morning i think um, the, the last song that we're going to sing today as we face the new week May we have the passion for this God, that the generous God that we have, that we focus ourselves to Him and nothing else. Shall we all stand, please, and let us sing prayerfully. Look at this verse or these songs. May this be our prayer. All right.
passion for Thee, O Lord, set a fire in my soul and a thirst for my God. Hear Thou my prayer, O Thy power in part, not just to serve, but to love Thee.